Welcome to the Deliberate Leaders Podcast. I'm Allison Dunn, your host, and today I am super excited with the guest that we have today. His name is Michael Payton, and he goes by Payton, um, so I'm going to drop the Michael from here on out. Um, Payton is the author of Get a Grip, as well as um, a co-author of, were you a co-author of Traction as well? No, Gino wrote uh, Traction, he and I co-authored Get a grip. Together. Get a grip. Okay, so I just want to give get a grip the full uh, the full authority as it's how to get everything you want from your entrepreneurial business, and it is an awesome read. So I highly encourage you to read the book. Um, so today he also works with co-author Gino um, at the EOS Worldwide. In his role, he works hands on with hundreds of leader leadership teams to help them implement the operating system in their business. So. Thank you very much for joining us here today, Peyton. It's great to have you. Absolutely, my pleasure, Allison. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I um, I know what EOS stands for, but I'm hoping that you'll kindly introduce the concept to my listeners. Sure, it's, it stands for the Entrepreneurial Operating System, and my longtime friend and co-author and business partner, Gino Wickman, created EOS because when he was trying to run his family business as a young entrepreneur, um, he discovered that all the tools in the marketplace available for people to become better leaders, managers, and runners of businesses were sort of oriented around corporate leadership. And he detected a massive difference between the person who owns and runs a small, fast-paced, rapidly growing business and somebody who leads a large corporation with teams that come to you with strategic decisions to make. Mm -hmm. And he really sought to create a simple uh, set of timeless tools and disciplines that would help entrepreneurs get more of what they want from their businesses. So are you saying that you feel like the EOS was designed for a larger organization? Ten to people, privately held organizations with between 10 and 250 people whose okay. owners are growth oriented, open minded, more afraid of the status quo than they are of change and want help. Yeah. That's who it was built for and absolutely not the large organization. Okay. Okay. I am, um, I would say there's a few books that I will consistently um, recommend. Um, that support uh, my general principles of what I um, teach as an executive coach. And Traction is, I'd say, in one of my top two most commonly. Like, you've got to re- you've got to read this and help um, help business owners and organizations understand um, yeah. some systems, and, right? Some yeah, dis- and, I, and, and Allison, I'm, uh, your listeners should know I'm here because I had the same uh, impression when I read Traction for the first time 13 yeah. years ago. I was running the seven million dollar company and i was frustrated and and stuck and a neighbor introduced me to gino and and the book traction had just been printed for the first time and it's you know simple timeless stuff Mm -hmm. uh but it just really resonated with me and um felt like we were on the verge of uh helping ourselves and the ability to help a lot of other people and that's what i've been enjoying doing ever since for sure. So I'm just I'm curious because I always like to know um, you've run um, a seven million dollar business. What industry? What type of business was it? Yeah. So I I ran or helped run four entrepreneurial companies, and the fourth uh, the, the last one was a uh, market research firm. Oh, Most interesting. Headquartered here in Minneapolis. Uh, the three prior to that were in various service industries. Uh, but uh, always a member of the leadership team, always uh, typically on the go-to-market sales and marketing side. And, um, you know, two great successes and two uh, dismal failures. And uh, obviously you learn a lot more and grow a lot faster when you're struggling. And uh, truly, uh, goodness knows I've struggled plenty for almost everybody tuning into your, your podcast. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that humble honesty. I think um, the best learnings come from when you struggle through how things sometimes don't work um, to figure out how they do work. Um, So I'm hoping we can spend a few minutes doing a little bit of a a deep dive on the EOS system. And um, there's a few key elements for me and how I um, look at organizations that I work with, and so I'm hoping, like when you when you tu- tune into those, I'll kind of have you dive deeper into those particular Perfect. topics. If love that's it. Okay. Yeah, I love that. All right. So, 
Could you do um, a general breakdown for my audience of what the EOS model is? Yeah, so um, you know, one of the discoveries Gino made early on when he was uh, working with fellow entrepreneurs to help them solve the common business challenges they were facing is that all the issues we tend to wrestle with, and entrepreneurs love to wrestle with issues. We got 136 at the same time, there's a cloud (laughs) hole, right? And uh, God forbid everything be running along smoothly, that's scary. And uh, what he found was the common problems, challenges, and obstacles tended to fall into six areas, or what we now call the six key components. And to the extent an organization can be great at these six things or strong in these six key components, you know, all those 136 issues just tend to fall into place. And so it's vision, which is getting everybody in the organization 100% on the same page with where you're going and how you plan to get there. People, which is the art and science of attracting and retraining great people. And, And great is a definition we work to create for every unique organization because there's no standard definition of great person. It's unique from organization Mm -hmm. to organization. Uh, Data, which is running your business on objective information, facts and figures rather than feelings, egos, emotions, um, and and using that data to make better, stronger, faster decisions. And uh, from there, what we find is when you're strong in the vision, people and data components, your organization becomes a lot more transparent, which is a blessing and a curse because that means you smoke out a lot of issues. And so the fourth key component is, is the issues component. And the issues component is about getting better at recognizing when you have issues, getting them on a list and solving them for the long-term greater good. We're not trying to make people better at creating issues. We're trying to make them better at resolving those issues. Um, and then the process component is the ability to get the most important stuff in your business done the right and best way every time Mm -hmm. without you having to be there to coach, mentor, manage, and redirect people. And that's what allows you to create consistency and scalability in your business so you can grow it to any size you choose. Mm -hmm. And then the final component, the sixth key component is called the traction component. And it's at the bottom of the EOS model for a reason, because we find if you have a clear vision, and you can't bring it down to the ground and execute on that vision, you feel like you're just spinning your wheels. And that's what frustrates so many entrepreneurs. And so traction's about instilling discipline and accountability throughout the company and giving you the feeling that everywhere you look, people are helping get you closer to achieving that vision rather than spinning wheels or actually pulling you away from achieving. One of the things um, on the topic of vision um, is that I work with a lot of people who truly are the visionary Mm -hmm. of their business. And um, I loved the um, introduction of the role of the integrator Mm -hmm. that so many businesses um, wait too long to get um, in a lot of cases. And then once they get them, they don't know what to do with them. Do you have any guidance on how to get your, your organization aligned with the, inter- the, the visionary allowing an integrator to come in and do? Yeah. Um, yeah, and the, before I go into the details of how, you know, I want to share a little context. Visionary entrepreneurs are by nature great builders of things. Mm-hmm. And often um, from scratch with as many obstacles as possible. And the more people telling you you can't possibly <laughs> succeed, the better, right? Mm-hmm. So the way that feels to do that successfully and the skills required to do that successfully are just so vastly different from the skills required to keep 40 trains running on time every day. Mm -hmm. And so that's the context I like to share when we're talking about visionary integrator because I don't want to make anybody feel bad that it took them a little while to recognize their business was less about building something and overcoming obstacles and more about keeping trains running on time. It's normal to kind of have a little delay there, right? Mm -hmm. And what visionary entrepreneurs recognize when they're stuck in that place is that they feel out of place in their own business. They lose their passion. They're frustrated by their people and lack of profit. And, you know, nobody really cares enough or gets it. And, and so, you know, your, your people watching this podcast, please know you're normal if that's the way you feel. And it is not your lot in life to have to make that transition 
and change who you are to be a great leader of your organization. That's the power of the visionary in a greater partnership is a great visionary paired with a person whose mm -hmm. genetic encoding is keeping trains running on time. Man, what a powerful combination that is. And, and that's how it's easy to let go is when you embrace your inner visionary mm -hmm. and you welcome in somebody whose job is distinctly different from your um, genetic encoding and you work together as partners with healthy, productive conflict for the greater good of the organization. So hopefully that helps. That is super helpful. I, um, I recognize that when an organization or uh, can, can find that pair, um, that's really when truly the magic does happen um, yeah. and having the right people in the right seat. So that kind of leads me to my next question. So just um, generally people, um, how, um, <laughs> What, um, what are the most common things that you find when someone is not in the right position inside of an organization? Like how do, often people go like, how do I know when I'm supposed to let them go? And I'm like, well, if you're thinking it, then maybe, <laughs> maybe. Or, or have you not already let them go in your head, right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So, you know, six months earlier than when the first thought first of, of, occurred. Sure. <laughs> so, right. You know, and again, when we talk about the people component in a vacuum, it's a little dangerous because it can come off sounding cold hearted. And, yeah. you know, so what we're teaching entrepreneurs to do is, is accept the responsibility of defining what a great person means for your organization, because nobody can be successful in a company, no matter how um, well intentioned they are and how skilled they are, if they don't know what your expectations are. And so we use Jim Collins terminology, right person in the right seat to identify two distinct attributes that are really critical of a great person. You got to fit our culture or consistently exhibit our core values. And you got to be really good at your job without a lot of coaching, mentoring, or redirection necessary for me. Otherwise, I'm never going to get any of my own stuff done, right? Mm -hmm. Those are two reasonable expectations. And we try and bring clarity and simplicity to those two expectations by clearly defining core values and communicating them consistently to everybody in the organization, and then clearly defining everyone's five roles in the seat they own on an accountability chart, and, and which enables a leader or a manager to say to their people, hey, if you share our core values and you're really good at this job, man, we've got a great partnership here. And that's the number one reason you have people issues is you're not taking enough time to create clarity around that. Once you do create clarity, 80% of the time they say, thank you very much. I'm glad you've made yourself clear. I'll work harder at these things and they're good to go. And 20% of the time they're just not, they're not a fit. Right. And that's when you have to have open and honest, direct two-way conversations with your people, sit them down and let them know there's a gap. It's not your job to figure out why there's a gap. Just let them know there's a gap offer a partnership to them so that you can coach them up. And if you can't coach them up, you got to replace them with somebody who shares your core values and is really good at his or her job. It's very simple stuff, but because humans are involved, it's very difficult. It is, um, it's incredible how long organizations do keep someone with, and keep them in a very unclear position about how to actually be successful. And I'd say that is probably the most common challenge that I see. Is yeah, there's of, a, yeah, go ahead. Um, the lack of clarity on, on what it is that you expect. Yeah, and of course the danger isn't necessarily the impact that has on that one relationship, right. but when that lack of clarity festers, and everybody in your organization knows there's somebody here that doesn't fit. They don't fit our culture. They're not good at their job. You run the risk of losing some people who do fit the culture and are great at their jobs because we're not dealing with this obvious problem and that's reflecting poorly on me. So that's where I get concerned and very passionate about we've given you a set of tools that help you identify the issue now we've got to figure out what we're going to do to go solve that issue and that's yeah. what eos brings to the table yeah people uh people are the most uh difficult part of an organization for sure let's go to the easier yeah. stuff let's talk about data how's that yeah you bet. <laughs> uh, except, unless we're talking about how data will let you know that it might be time to make a change to the people component. <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, how, what type of data would help someone understand when they do need to make a people change? What's your... Yeah, yeah so I, I'll share a little philosophy, first of all. You know, what we're trying to do is, is help the people who own, run, and work in the business use data to be great. The same way a championship team uses data to be great. It, 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 the data component isn't strong when you have a lot of data. It's strong when you're good at using the data you have to make better, stronger, faster decisions. And what's ironic to me, being in the business world as long as I have now, um, when I first started, there was little to no data in almost every organization. And today, more companies than not seem to be drowning in data and it's not helping them make better, stronger, faster decisions. So what we teach the leadership team to do is focus on five to 15 leading indicators that give you a, an ability to predict the future. How, how are results going to come out next month or next quarter and react to those off-track leading indicators to prevent failure from happening in the future. And then we migrate that discipline down into the organization so that every team, every department, every team, and every individual in the company has at least one number they all feel accountable for keeping on track. And then what happens when you do that well is you don't have to proactively manage to the data because if you've got somebody reporting to you, Allison, that has a number that's off track, they're coming to you as a manager and saying, hey, Ali, wh why, why is this number, I can't get it back on track, help me. What a great relationship that is, as opposed to the way I used to manage back in the pre-data days where I was laying in bed awake at night wondering if my people were being successful or not. Yeah. And scared to death to go ask them or assuming they'd lie anyway, so what was the point, right? So numbers just help bring clarity to a relationship that allow you to go have a healthy, constructive conversation when stuff isn't working. Mm -hmm. That's the approach we like, we like to take with the tools. Is there, um, Peyton, any one specific data point that is typically consistent among all scorecards? <laughs> I will tell you, most entrepreneurs like to see cash balance on their okay. five to 50. So, so you know, they make me laugh because yeah. that is not a leading indicator. It is anything. not. But it is a, but it is a sign that you're an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. I want to know when I'm about to run out of money. Is is you know is a common uh, thing. But yeah, no, I, you know, leading indicators that I see a lot are the number of leads, uh, the number of proposals sent, the dollar amount of those proposals. Uh, you know, opportunities qualified and quantified that we just put into our pipeline. And, you know, a great example I saw recently is a client of mine that runs medical uh, industry offices. They had been measuring uh, customer satisfaction survey scores, and we had a conversation about leading indicators. And the question I asked was, what are the leading indicators to dissatisfied customers? And so one of the things they came up with is when they have to wait more than five minutes beyond their appointment time before they're seen by the specialist, right? And so they put that on their scorecard. So those are the kinds of conversations we have that lead people to build the right scorecard for them that mm -hmm. gives them the absolute ability to predict. Um, I will share from, um, so I was a um, part of an employee ownership, um, an ESOP company. We were an engineering firm, and we still are an engineering firm, um, just to <laughs> clarify that. Um, our leading indicator after we went through probably maybe nine or ten different scorecards to try to figure out how we could drive the changes that we wanted to inside of our organization. And so some yeah. people think, well, I did a scorecard. You, honestly, you probably did it wrong the first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we say, we call it the first cut of the scorecard, and it will evolve over time. Right, sure. and ours did, and we honed it into what um, ended up becoming um, kind of the mantra of our entire organization, which was billable hours. And that seems so um, simplistic, and right. so um, I don't know. I almost felt like it was uh, I don't know constricting in some way. Right. That's but, right. And, and yeah. And, and yet when you measure everything, you measure nothing. Right. right. And so 
So, you know, what we preach at the leadership level of the organization is five to 15 leading indicators that give you an absolute pulse on how things are working throughout the business. And a lot of teams do tend to galvanize around one, two or three sort of bellwether measurables. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I've got clients that trend to the 15 side of that spectrum and clients that trend to the five and you got to find your own. And you know, an engineering company, talk about people who understand data mm -hmm. and want to see a lot of it. And so I, I applaud you for being able to narrow it down to something that would give you a leading indicator that you need to dive deeper and then on the second look, you can dive deeper and look at additional data. But if you're looking at all that data at once, what I see a lot, Allison, is there, you know, people are sitting around the table scratching their heads saying, what is this really telling me when you're drowning in data? And what we want you to do is look at these leading indicators and be able to make better, stronger, faster decisions. Yeah, I love that. I love data um, a lot. <laughs> From, so let's talk about um, issues and issues uh, from the point of like, I, um, I refer to your um, level 10 meeting. Yeah. Um, so that's, um, so how, um, how does an organization, so for me, I look at that's an issue that's not part of what we're talking about today and it goes to the issues list. How long can an issue stay on the issues list before <laughs> it, does, it ever gets addressed or it falls off? Well, let's let's define what an issue is okay. and, and what we do to solve it, and then we'll we'll answer that specific. So, so an issue is a problem, challenge, obstacle, roadblock. But that's kind of a Western Hemisphere definition of the word issue. It's also a new idea that you can't seem to find the time to pursue. A great opportunity out there in the marketplace, and yeah, we're so busy keeping the trains running on time, we don't have time for that. So, um, good and bad issues. And the two tools and disciplines we teach to strengthen the issue solving component is something we call an issues list, which if to the uninitiated is just like having a suggestion box in your building. And that's not what we're talking about at all. No. We're talking about changing the culture of an organization from a don't shoot the messenger fear of bringing things forward to a culture where everybody celebrates the person who's got the courage to raise his or her hand and says, hey, I don't know how to do my job. That piece of direction you gave me last week that you thought was crystal clear, it didn't make any sense to me at all. Those are the kinds of cultural changes we're trying to make here where people feel comfortable raising their hand and say, we gotta get better at this or we've got a problem we need to fix. Once you do that, we simply teach a discipline of solving the issue at the root, digging past the symptom that often gets itself onto the issues list. Oh, our sales are off track. That's a symptom of some larger root cause and really figuring out why our sales are off track and then solving that. That is how you prevent issues from lingering on your issues list for weeks, months, quarters, and even years. And there's two ways of doing that. You just ignore it. You wrap duct tape and twine around it and you convince yourself it's so big and hairy, if we untie that little piece of twine, all hell's gonna break loose. And so you sit in your office hoping it doesn't blow up on you. Or you've been trying to solve it every quarter since the, you know, the first day of your business and you just keep solving symptoms and never really solve it at the root. And EOS gives you a framework for getting better at that over time. Okay. So do you, is it simple enough to ask you, can you share the general framework for how to identify the issue? Yeah, so it, it and it is such a simple framework, half of your uh, viewers are gonna click, leave this meeting right now. <laughs> no, they're not, I promise. I just ask questions. So so my job as a facilitator, when this is happening in my session room is, is I'll say, all right, who's teeing up the issue and who you're talking to. It's always somebody who's got a question, need or issue okay. and somebody else who's got to make a decision. And I'll say in one sentence with no commas, uh, which is very important for some people, uh, can you hit the nerve? What's the root cause of this issue? And if we don't hear the root cause right out of the gate, I just keep asking questions. Whoa, whoa, I haven't heard the real issue yet. Could you try and re-articulate that issue? What do you need? And I'm literally just asking questions. 
until everybody in the room kind of goes, okay, there's the issue. Until you hear that sweet sound of agreement, that's the issue we've got to solve, then we jump to discuss. And when the issue is crystal clear and we all agree, the discussion is usually really short. And then usually a decision needs to be made. And decisions are almost always simple when the issue is clear. That doesn't make them easy. Sometimes you got to let somebody go or shut down a business unit that you've got some passion for or disappoint a customer or an employee. Those are hard decisions, but it, that they're not complex decisions. Mm -hmm. And so that's how IDS works to, to help you really pinpoint what you need to solve and make the decisions necessary to move the business forward. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. I think um, I think uh, we often uh, look at issues and it's really a symptom. And so to like how to dive down to find actually the issue itself. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Brilliant. Um, let's talk about processes. Um, so I would consider this to be the fifth step of the EOS system. Um, and um, a stumbling block that a lot of organizations have on the best way to document the process. Um, and then once it's written, that it goes on a shelf and then no one follows the process. What are your tips for all of us that have that or know people who have that? Yeah, so uh, what we, what we uh, teach is a 2080 approach to documenting, simplifying, and getting your core processes followed by all, sort of the anti-SOP manual approach. Okay. And so, you know, number one, we start this endeavor at the leadership team and we make the case that if we don't all agree what the handful of truly core processes are, the things that make us unique, our secret sauce, well, then what are we documenting in the first place? And so we get the leadership team to agree on what they are. And every organization has an HR process, for example, a marketing process, a sales mm -hmm. process, handful of operating processes an account or customer retention or satisfaction process and maybe an accounting process. It's literally just a handful. And then we agree what they are, where they start and stop and what their names are. And then one process at a time, we go document and simplify them by identifying the 20% of the steps that get us 80% of the results. And we work to get on the same page. When we're selling something, we should start with this step and then do this and then do that. And yes, my goodness, I know that every customer is different and every sale is different, but if we have our druthers, how should we manage the process? If we can control it start to finish, and I know we can't. And we get that on paper and we all look at it, we try and poke holes in it. And when we all agree, then we say, all right, let's just teach everybody who's engaged in even one step in the sales process that this is the way we do it at ABC Company. And if you do that for your handful of core processes, you're gonna have a five to 25 page process manual, mm -hmm. a series of pilots checklists that everybody in the organization will use because they're one or two pages long. And you can use that to train people in on the basics, knowing that as they become more experienced or ask questions of your more senior staff or your managers, they'll learn to fill in the blanks between those major steps in the processes in a way that you'd be proud of them. That's our philosophy. And it is so, again, painfully simple that um, it, it, it is difficult to believe it actually works. And I've just seen it work so darn many times. It's super powerful. Um, do you, uh, I can just speak from my own experience. I would get serious pushback on suggesting that um, that 100% wouldn't go into a system at my engineering firm. It's sort of like, well, just this is kind of the, the structure. Like, if we follow just this general structure, and they're like, <laughs> the detail. So um, is, is that uncommon to get pushed back on? Yeah, in engineering and accounting firms, it's super common. Okay, so that so, is, I hear that all the time. And okay. all I say, there's a little karate in this work, right, where you use the momentum against you. What I'll say to a leader who's uh, advocating for that is, I'll tell you what, what we're focused on at the leadership level is building an executive summary of the detailed process you want to go build, okay? So if you're accountable for sales in the engineering company and you think we need a 25 page document, I'm not going to die on that hill, Allison. But what I am going to say is before you go build that 25 page document, wouldn't it benefit you to make sure your entire leadership team agrees 
that this is the executive summary of the major steps in that process. And then we can say, go build it any way you want, as long as you follow these major steps. Yeah, I like that. And then if you want to make a change, come back and talk to us about the high level document, because that's the other thing. If you want to get everybody in the company on the same page with something, an 87 page document is the worst possible way to do that. Nobody ever reads those documents <laughs> in enough detail to get on the same page. So that's yeah. sort of the philosophy of EOS is let's start at a high level, get aligned and then go to the level of detail that's necessary for you and your team. Okay, I like that. Um, I'm um, I'm not a detail gal, but working with um, you know a hundred other engineers, it kind of forced me to you know swing in a different direction, and um, it was hard. Yes. And I'm not I don't mean to be dissing my engineers. Yeah. I love my engineers, but yeah, no, um, but, but but I you know again, you are who you are, and sure. that's the great that's the great thing about this work is yeah. you know we got people around the table, and and it's better when they are who they are than it is when they try and be something else. So. <laughs> so let's talk about um, the final step in the EO system and you know traction. And I love I love the word traction. It implies action. It implies like moving forward. It's it's a strong word. What holds people back from getting traction? What what holds businesses back from getting traction? Well, one of the things I hear a lot when I go do a talk or a workshop with a room full of visionary entrepreneurs is I'll get a handful of people come up afterwards and say, you know that traction component, when you talk about discipline and accountability, Peyton, that's what we really need. And I say, oh, is that right? What do you mean? Oh, I'm, I'm thinking if I put this in, the people around we will be more disciplined and accountable. And I get to say, aha, I think we might have identified a root cause here because you can't have a group of people around you that are disciplined and accountable if you, the owner, founder, leader, visionary, aren't willing to be a little bit more disciplined and accountable too. And you know, one of the things that I think helps EOS be effective is we start by working with the entire leadership team, including the visionary. Now, the cool thing about visionaries is we're only holding them accountable to being great visionaries and we're trying to relieve them from the duty to be also great at owning the finance seat and the approving all the expenses and selling everything and making all the key strategic decisions so we're building a team around them to be accountable for the parts of the job that have worn them out. But you got to be willing to be accountable and disciplined yourself in order to create an organization that runs on discipline and accountability. And that's the number one challenge uh, I see entrepreneurial companies. We're the world's greatest rationalizers. Yeah, I didn't get any of the three things I said I was going to do when we met a quarter ago done, but I did do these three new ideas that plopped on my desk. So why are you looking at me like that? I mean, you know, and I'm as guilty as the next guy of that, so. All right, um, you just alluded to it, which was my next question is, um, working with the leadership team, identifying the three, and, and you referenced them as rocks uh, for the yeah. quarter. Um, when are you allowed to not work on the rock that you've identified? Like, when is that okay? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, just a, a little context. Um, you know, we first set company rocks with the leadership team. What are the three to seven essential life or death priorities for our organization this quarter? And then once we've set those rocks, we assign each rock to a member of the leadership team. And then we ask them to fill out the rest of their rocks for the quarter. So everybody walks out of this session clear on the three to seven priorities for our organization and my three to seven priorities and they should consume your time and attention. Um, and all, all of my leadership team members have day jobs too, so they learn very painfully how to allow for the typical day job and stuff that happens and the crises that occur in the middle of the quarter. And, and ideally, you're laser focused on pushing those priorities over the finish line quarter in and quarter out. On rare occasion, a new priority crops up and you know, it, it is going to take some time and energy and you make a strategic decision that this new thing that just landed on my desk today is more important than one of my three to seven rocks this quarter. And you talk to your leadership team members, just you don't get to make this decision unilaterally and say, you know, I'm feeling like this new thing is more important than this and I can't do both. So I'm going to quit working on this rock. That happens two or three times a year. It's not the end of the world okay. any more than two times a year for the whole team. I'm not just 
talking about each individual, whole team, you just need to get better at predicting. Okay, so can swap them out, but it's it's improving your prediction of what's going to be most important. I wouldn't say swap them out. I, well, we call that a non-rock. I'm going to stop non-rock. working on this thing. <laughs> I've got another priority that's consuming some bandwidth. It's not going to be a rock for me until we're writing rocks next quarter, but I need your permission to quit working on this thing we agreed was a priority. That's called a non-rock. Okay, I like it. Um, What would you say is the number one benefit that people have expressed from working through or starting your EOS model? Yeah, uh, great question. We actually did a survey almost nine years ago now where we were hoping to get a lot of really powerful data about the impact on businesses that EOS has had. And the number one response to this survey was, you gave me my life back. Yeah. You gave me my life back. And and I can't tell you the number of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs' family members who have emailed or called me to say thank you for that. Because, you know, what people who aren't entrepreneurs don't understand is on the cover of the magazine, it all looks fabulous, but it is a lonely, frightening, painful existence many days sure. out of the year. And you know, my, my big message to everybody I talk to is, it is not your lot in life to be unhappy every day when you go to the office, to have lost your passion for your business, to feel like you've got to make a choice between being a good entrepreneur and a good husband or wife or parent to your family. It, it, you don't need to make that choice. You just got to figure out how to break through the ceiling find a great group of people around you you can trust to help you achieve your vision and generate a little traction. And uh, that's the number one benefit. Yeah. Um, kindred spirits in that respect. Um, I love the fact that I get to do that every day too. Yeah, too. Um, I've got two uh, two more questions. And I if, if you don't know the answer to this, that's perfectly fine. So I've got um, Get a Grip in my hand. Um, and then on my bookshelf, which is right over here, I've got traction, I've got rocket fuel, I've got maybe a few more on my nightstand at home. What order do I read? The, what order should someone consume? So it sort of in? depends on who you are and where you are in the organization. So okay. the best place to start, in my opinion, is traction. It is the definitive how-to guide for an entrepreneur or an entrepreneurial leadership team member. How do I put the system Gino created to work in my own business. And you're gonna get the most lift from that book. He and I wrote Get a Grip for a number of reasons, one of which was a lot of visionaries and other leaders are more experiential learners than they are how-to learners. Mm -hmm. And Get a Grip tells a story. It's a business fable about a real life company implementing EOS. And so if you happen to be an experiential learner, you learn more by doing or watching than you do by reading or studying, uh, that's a great read. How to Be a Great Boss is a great book for people who lead and manage others. It's the EOS way of driving accountability. And uh, is the title the Is the title of that one, How to Be a Great Boss? Oh, how to Be a Great Boss. I don't own that one. Yeah, so I would run to the store immediately oh. <laughs> where books are sold. Uh, but but that's written by my by Gino and my longtime friend and colleague Renee Bohr, and it's a fabulous piece of work. Very simple, very high level. Will make everybody a better leader and manager. Rocket Fuel is a good book for visionaries or integrators or other leadership team members to read to understand the visionary integrator partnership. And then what the heck is EOS? is sort of the basic primer. A lot of frontline uh, staff or mid-managers, frontline leaders, managers, team leaders, get real value from just understanding why EOS is important and what each of the basic foundational tools are and what my job is in making sure we're using them properly. So those are the five books in the Traction Library and that's why you should read each of them. Awesome. Well, I'm missing one, so I will go out and, and procure okay. that. Renee, Renee says thank you. <laughs> um, I'm just curious, how many implementers do you have nationwide? So around the world, it's 350 now. I'd say that's about 320 in the U.S. and 30 internationally. Um, and the growth rate internationally is significant. 
significantly higher than the growth growth rate uh, locally. I'm not so surprised. It's, the growth has been amazing, and and we're excited about it. It's 350 world class individuals. I'm proud of all friends and colleagues. No doubt, I'm sure. Um, Peyton, what would be the best way for people to be able to find you or follow you online? What would you recommend? Yeah, so f from a resource center standpoint, our website, eosworldwide.com, is a place you can find everything. I'm there on the implementer directory, okay. um, so people can connect to me direct from there. My uh, email, I know my assistant will provide you for you to put in your show notes, but I welcome Perfect. anybody reaching out directly to me. Um, we're all here to help. The, the community of professional EOS implementers is just excited about the opportunity to help entrepreneurs and their leadership team. So if we can help, please reach out yeah. and we'll be here to help you. Awesome. Peyton, it has been such a pleasure speaking to you today. Great. Thank you for your time and all that you're doing for the world.